while we were talking, uh, codec control room that we want to have backgrounds projected behind me, like of a beach or, or of you know the Grand Canyon or you know just just nice like scenes. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, depending on the day. So if you guys could get on that and, and let let me know how that comes out. All right, today we are. Oh, I want to talk about uh, a couple of things. Um, and then going forward um, to one of the more important chapters. I mean, they're all important, but this one's important, important. All right. First thing. Um, the first couple of assignments are easy for folks to turn in because there's typically just like one HTML file. But at a certain point, there starts to become difficulty when there's CSS files and image files and, and HTML files and maybe even multiple HTML files. First of all, you have to turn everything in. All right? So all your images, and again, you shouldn't hot link to an image. That is, you should actually have a copy of the image on your machine as opposed to pointing somewhere on the internet. Um, but all your images, all your CSS files, all your pages, um, I need those to grade it because if it's supposed to link two pages together, I can't tell if that works if I don't have both pages. And likewise, if I don't have your CSS, I can't see how it's supposed to look. And if I don't have the images, I can't see all that. Bottom line is I really can't grade it if there's uh, stuff missing. Um, so that, that's sort of the first assumption. The easiest thing to do is this, is to create, do sort of like I do with the examples here. Uh, which is, um, let's see, where is an example? Actually, I do everything, I, I have done everything on the desktop, but let me go and, and show you maybe a better way to do it. Um, make a folder on your desktop or wherever you'd like it to be, and give it a name, something like, you know, Lab 6. Then have all the files for that lab inside that folder. So in this case, I think I had these four files. So if I look inside that folder, I see these four files. The image, the uh, two HTML files, and the CSS. Let me make sure those are the only ones I need. Okay. There we go. All right. So I have everything all in that one folder. The easiest thing to do is then go and just zip that folder, that is compress it, and then attach that one single zip file uh, there. Otherwise, it's just too easy to miss something if you do it like one file at a time or, or something like that. So you'd right mouse on it and say, send to compress file. And there you go. And then that would be the file that you'd attach. Now, some of you have started to do things like um, create other directories for your files, which is a good practice. And I haven't really talked about that, but it's something that you can do. So for example, you could create a images uh, folder. So I'll go and create an images folder here. And I will put let's say I'll just do this one file but you could do it for all of them I could put the one file in there now in my HTML document to refer to it I have to give what's called the full path or, or uh, the relative path to it so in other words originally it was in the same folder so I could just use the name of the file so if an image is in the same folder as um, as the HTML file, all I need to do is give the name of the HTML file and that will work. But now that I've moved it into a subfolder called images, I have to put the name of the subfolder in front of it. So I have to go images slash stadium. It's always the forward slash. It's, not the it's never the backslash. All right? So even on Windows, those of you that have done stuff in Windows, you might say, well, do I put a backslash in there? No. The web 
syntax is different than the, the syntax of the operating system. Because you didn't try all the browsers. Yeah. Uh, some browsers it won't work in those things. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we can go and save this. And then now the image will appear again. Now, if you do this again, if you follow what I suggested before of going up and compressing that folder, whoops. And send that to me, all right, then I'll be fine because I'll get everything and I'll get the folder inside of it. Occasionally what people will do is they'll like do something like they'll zip up this or they'll zip up the folder and then send these files individually. Then I lose the sense of where the thing should be positioned. You know, what is in what folder if you do it that way, if you do it separately. That's why it's important just to zip up the whole folder with everything inside of it, all the subfolders and everything. Then I can go and sort of um, bring it back up and I get the same structure. Think of a, a zip file like, like, like uh, you know, uh, dehydrated, like, like dehydrated food, you know. Uh, freeze dried or, or whatever. All right. When you compress it, you're bringing it back to life. You, you're rehydrating it and you're adding water to it to, to make it. And, and again, that's just a metaphor. Please don't pour water on, on any of these files. All right. But one thing to note is with a compressed folder, a lot of students sometimes are disturbed by this. By a compressed folder, if you open it up and look, you won't see your web page correctly. All right, notice I don't get the CSS and I can't see the image. The reason is, is when you zip it up, when you view it inside the compressed folder, you're still viewing it in its sort of dehydrated state. All right, you're not viewing all the files fully expanded. So you always have to expand it. So if you wanted to view it again, you'd have to go in and extract all. then you would have the pages in a position where you could view them again. So I noticed uh, over the weekend I caught up in this class at least, you know, yay. Uh, and I noticed a lot of folks had some issues with that. And um, if it was like one thing that maybe you forgot to upload, uh, I might have given you a break or I might have only deducted a little bit uh, depending on, on the specifics of it. If there was a few things that you didn't uh, upload or didn't upload correctly and I wasn't able to view the page the way that it was intended, um, I, I probably deduct, you know, a, a, a few points and I put a message. One thing to keep in mind is that at least at this point in the semester, if you do not get full credit for something, uh, you can rework it and turn it in. So. Um, a lot of people, again, check. I, I've graded up through lab five, I believe. So go back and check uh, lab, you know, um, go back and check um, the grades that you've gotten for those and should, should have emails. If not, you can go through ANGEL and, and through reports and see your grades. But um, if you did get points deducted, you can, you can rework it for credit. All right. What's next? Uh-huh. Okay. Keep in mind, I mean, this, you know, the stuff that we're talking about and the stuff you need, need to do for your pages really, you know, has nothing to do with the FTP or the HTTP, you know, or, well, the HTTP maybe is relevant, but uh, there's no FTP examples for this class. All right, so... Um, Okay. Um, 
The big thing to remember, again, is if you do put things in different directories, you have to put then the path from wherever you are now, wherever your page is, to that file. So if there's an images subfolder, you put images slash and go from there. Um, if you look on page um, 192, they talk about different ways that you can do colors other than the RGB. And the key thing with these is that they add the element of the transparency to it. Now, a word of caution ab uh, about this is that, um, guess what, doesn't work in earlier versions of Internet Explorer, all right? Which kind of, in my mind, kind of makes it like, I won't say useless, but um, that wouldn't be my choice to do right now. I would, use the, I would stick with the RGB uh, styling of, of the colors. Um, and um, if I wanted to set transparency, there, there's a, a different way that you can do it. Um, if we go out and we go to Google, I just went set transparency CSS, setting all browsers transparency. They'll show you a way to do it. Actually, this is sort of the code that you can put in to make your stuff transparent. So if you want to play around with that, that would be my suggestion to use that syntax instead of trying um, the other stuff. So, yeah, um, you can you can find that um, in Google. Um, but again, there, there, you know, th that's that's why I haven't gone over the other kinds of colors because again, you know, you'd run into trouble with uh, with IE. But if you want to play with transparency, you can do that. You can get some nice effects uh, by by playing with transparency and and setting transparent background so you can let maybe your background image peek through a little bit, all right, and so on. All right. Chapter 8. Um, we covered um, a good portion of Chapter 8. I want to talk about um, the two pieces of Chapter 8 that we didn't cover or, or maybe we didn't stress would be a better way to put it. And we talked about creating uh, an external CSS file. All right, and we did that in this example where we had where we have, instead of having the actual CSS code in our web page, we have a link to a CSS file that lives somewhere else. And that's sort of our normal way of doing things. That's the way we're going to do things most of the time. All right. There's a couple of exceptions, though. And I want to chat about those exceptions for a minute All right, um, and talk about like when you would use them and so on. All right, a couple things to keep in mind is that, first of all, you can apply more than one CSS to a given page. All right, so I could actually have something like this. I could have style CSS and style to CSS, and it would get both styles. Well, 
you might be able to see a, a, a problem with that or a, a confusing situation. Is what if I set the background color of the page to two different colors? Which color gets it? And it would be it would get the second color. All right. So um, if there's two style sheets, then the second one takes precedence over the first one. All right. Now you might ask yourself, when would you do that? And you actually could possibly do that in the case of, of developing for a mobile web browser. All right. When you develop for a mobile web browser, and we'll just touch on this, and, and there's, a, there's you know, a brand new class that we have on mobile web development that goes into this in detail. But when you develop pages for a mobile uh, device, as well as for a full-blown computer, you might actually have two style sheets. And through your code, every page gets the first style sheet. And depending on certain characteristics uh, of the page, will it get the second style sheet. And in that way, you can keep your pages looking similar, but not identical as you move from desktop to mobile. All right. At this point, it's just important for us to recognize that, yeah, you can have two style sheets, and then the second one takes precedence over the first if they have things in common. If they don't have things in common, then they don't interfere with each other, and you'll get both of them. All right? So that's external style sheets. The other thing that you can have is you can have what's called an embedded style sheet. And that is where you put your style code right here. All right, so I could say h2 color red. All right, and that's where I embed my style sheet right there in the middle of my HTML page. Now, what's the downside of doing this, of course, is that you don't have the reusability. In other words, if there was something I really wanted co in common for every single page, this wouldn't be a good way to do it, right? Because I would have to then put this on every single page, and I lose the benefit of reusability, all right? In other words, if I decide I wanted to change that from red to green, I'd have to go in and change every HTML page from red to green. And that's, that's not really good, all right? So therefore, the only time you would use this if there was some, some exceptional case that most of your pages you want your H2s to be green, but on this specific page, for some reason, you want it to be red. All right? Now, why would you want that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe this page had legal disclaimers on it. So H2s were a little different on this page. Instead of H2s being uh, regular headings, they were headings in a legal disclaimer or something like that. Or maybe they're like warning messages or something like that. And you could go in and on this specific page you could say, okay, every H2 on this page I know represents a warning so I could go and put it in. Even then you could probably figure out a way to do it with an external style sheet that would work, all right? But just playing the devil's advocate, that's kind of when you would do something like this, all right? But as I said before, it's, it's on an exception basis because you lose the benefit of being able to reuse this code and being able to change it in one place and get the change made on, on every one of your pages. So you'd use an external style sheet if there was really just something about this page that was an exception, that you wanted to be a certain way on this page and only this page. All right. The other thing that is probably even more of an exception would be that you can actually put what are called inline styles. And an inline style, actually let me undo that, would look like this. Where you actually put as an attribute of the HTML tag, you put the style rule. Style equals, and then in quotes, you put the style rule. Now that's even probably more of an exception, right? Because that actually, you could have this strewn throughout your code. 
And that can make it very tricky to tell why something gets a certain color because you have to really examine all the code. If all your style code is in one place, then it's easy to see where it is, right? It's in that one file. If you start doing this, then it makes it harder to, to see. Um, but yeah, you can. You know, there's been, there's been occasions where I knew this one page was the only place, and more so even in this one page, this one tag, I knew it was the only pay, uh, tag on my whole website that I wanted to look different. So I, you go in and put uh, uh, an embedded style, and, and it'll work. All right? But again, these last two techniques of the embedded and the inline style should be an exception. You should do it... Um, Again, just in, in fairly rare cases. Sort of the, the, the standard will be using the external style sheet. That's what you're going to do most of your stuff in. And if once in a while you do this for some exceptional case, then that's okay. And again, the closer the style rule is to the tag itself, it's going to apply. So in other words, this is going to take precedence of these other two. Let's go just for laughs, and I'll put a style rule for uh, an H1 in all three places to try to confuse it. So I have, in my external style sheet, I have a color green. In my embedded style sheet for H1s, I have a color red, and then I have an inline style on this H1 for a color blue. So let's see what colors these end up. This one ends up blue. This one ends up whatever color that is. That one ends up green. All right, why? Because again, the, I swear it, I would have thought that it would have been. Yeah, go ahead. The generated what line? The green line. Yes. But still, it should, my guess is it would have been red. So I have H1 color red. Oh. I didn't, I messed up that. There we go. Now it will be red. There we go. All right. So why is this one blue and this one red? Well... This one's blue because I have an inline style that says to make it blue. The other one's red because I have an embedded style that says make it red. And none of them are green because um, this is in the external file and it gets overridden by these other two. If I get rid of this then, that second one's going to be green. All right. One thing you can do, if you want something to apply all the time, you can put exclamation point important. And that tells the browser, hey, I don't care what your normal rules are, apply this style. So in this case, you would expect that one to be blue because I have an inline style for it. But because I said important in the, in the external style sheet, that's the one that it gets. All right? As you can see, this can get confusing sometimes. All right? When you start applying style rules that apply um, 
when you have one thing on the page where multiple style rules apply, it can get confusing what it gets. All right. It may actually get part of its style from one style rule and part of its style from a different one. So uh, it's, it's logical. If you sit down and think it all the way through, you can usually see why the browser did it the way that it did it. All right. But just because something's logical doesn't mean it isn't confusing. All right. So uh, you may have to go and, and um, uh, sometimes uh, think through it. My suggestion, again, is, is try to keep your style sheets fairly simple. Don't try to create all these convoluted ones that do a bunch of things. You know, keep them relatively simple, and then that's easier to find out. And again, um, when I say that, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, to not to try to do a lot with the CSS. But I guess what I'm saying is don't overcomplicate things. Don't micromanage things, and, and, and you can, uh, you know, you, it'll make it easier to debug. You know, don't don't dumb your page down for sure. As as I think Einstein said, things should be as simple as they need to be, but no simpler. So, again, try to make the code simple, but get it to do what you want it to do uh, as well. Um, let's see. I'm just going to mention. This is sort of a precursor. On page 208, this is like in a movie when they set up a hook for the sequel. Here I'm setting up the hook for the sequel, the mobile web development class. On 208, they talk about using media-specific style sheets. What that allows you to do is that allows you to have a different style sheet depending on how the person is viewing the page. For example, to print a page out, all right? A lot of times, for example, if there's a background image, you don't want the background image to show when you print it out. You might not want the page navigation to show. If uh, A classic example of this is like if you go to Google Maps. You know, you go to Google Maps and you go and there's all these navigation and there might be ads and there's all these options on there. But when, when the day is done and you want to print out the directions, you just want a, simp a, a very simplified list of things. All right. Um, likewise, if you were printing out a page that had complicated images and stuff, you might not need that when you go to print it out. Now, one way to handle that is by having a different style sheet for print printing than you do for displaying on the screen. And so if you look on page 208, they show the example where they have one style sheet that says media equals screen, and then the style sheet below it, they say media equals print. So you can make a separate style sheet, and then you can do, um, you can make the print style sheet be a lot simpler than the screen style sheet. And if you go to print it out, it will apply that one. Now, when you take this and extend this line of thought, that's when you get in style sheets. Uh, for mobile devices. When you use these media, these are called media queries. When you use these media queries in a little more elaborate way, you can create a separate style sheet for, um, for a, a mobile device versus a desktop. Let me show you an example of that. This is a project I've been working on in my, my mobile class. I have one page, or one set of pages rather, that you can view either on a mobile device or you can view it on a desktop device. So, let me bring it up on the mobile device.
right? Maybe a second, we'll bring it up here. Let me first bring it up on the desktop. And I did mess up a little bit here, but you'll, you'll still get the idea. Here's the site on the desktop, all right? What I messed up is I messed up the color of this back there. All right, but you should be able to see that. Should look kind of like that. Notice again, how does it look? It looks, it has a, 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 a big background image. Um, it has transparent divs. So this is transparent, and it might not be obvious, but if you look here, that's a little bit transparent. All right. And it's, and it's set up in two columns. All these things are great and look good on a desktop device, right? Look good on a computer. But don't look particularly good if you view it on a mobile device, right? Mobile device with limited bandwidth, you don't want to be downloading gigantic images. Also, multiple column web pages don't really look good uh, on a mobile device, right? Because the screen is, is a lot smaller. So that's how the page looks like on a mobile device, or I'm sorry, on a desktop device, this is how the page looks like on a mobile device. All right. Much more simple. So we can go to the members page. There's navigation down the bottom. Here, let's look up the members page on the desktop. All right. The images are in a little grid, side by side. All right. So, this is the identical HTML. All right. No, no, let me back up. I'm sorry, my mistake. In this case, this is not the identical HTML. There, there's actually two separate sets of HTML. But this could be the same HTML that just has different style sheets applied to it. All right? And we can make it look radically different all right? depending on, on that. So this is just an extension of that sort of thinking. Yes? How much of that the logic to the layout is built in by default? Actually, the, the question was, how much is built into the style sheet and how much did I have to like sort of hand code to get this sort of look on that? This, this uh, particular uh, site um, is using a, a what's called a framework called jQuery Mobile. And jQuery Mobile does a lot of the work for you. All right. So in other words, if you notice, this kind of looks like an iPhone app, right? I mean, with the little arrows here. Um, the little loading animation that goes around and, and the fact that the, the pages like sort of slide in. All right. All that's a function of the, of the framework. All right. So, you know, yeah, you have to do some work and the framework does some of the work and you sort of split the load for it. All right. So all this is an extension of the stuff that we've been talking about. And again, in this case, it's not literally identical HTML. I, I misspoke when I first said that. But it's very similar HTML. And we could make it identical HTML with a little bit of, of effort. Now. So then uh, uh, when you access the page with the mobile, the hardware tells the, the HTML page, hey, I'm yep. mobile. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. Well, I was, yeah. When, when you make a request, uh, part of what's included, when you, make, when you request a web page, and, and what do I mean? Like if you type in an address on your, on your mobile device, um, you, give a, you give a lot of information to the web server that you're making the request for. Part of that information that you give is called the user agent. All right? And the user agent is effectively, you know, am I browsing on a... Uh, a MacBook? Am I browsing on a Windows PC? Am I brow you know, or am I browsing on an Android phone? Am I browsing on a a whatever? And then based on that, the web server can make some decisions and do some different things. 
So there's a whole, there's a variety of techniques that you can do. That's one of the techniques that you can do. Uh, other techniques include setting the media query. For example, if we look here, here's an example of a media query that says, I want the second style sheet. I have two style sheets, the basic style sheet and the enhanced style sheet. And I want that second one only to apply if I'm viewing it on the screen that is a thousand characters or more wide. So this one is, th this particular style, I, I, a thousand is kind of a high number. I just did this as, a, as an example for my class. But essentially that's going to rule out a smaller, a smaller uh, um, device. All right? And therefore that second style won't apply. And therefore... Um, that style will only apply if you're, if you're browsing on a desktop that has a big monitor. All right. Um, one thing they talk about towards the end is, is getting inspiration uh, from, from different CSS that you see. And we talked a little bit in lab about viewing the CSS and all that. Um, for any, any designer, inspiration's uh, an important thing. Um, let's hold that thought for one second because I skipped page 210. They talk about offering alternative style sheets and you can read through that on your own. That's become less important because browsers have become more flexible for allowing you to do things like zooming in and all that. All right. But 212 is uh, a good example of, they talk about inspiration, they talk about like how you can view the source, core, so, source code for uh, a CSS file and so on. Um, I want to bring up a site now that I think is inspirational. Um, and it's inspirational for a couple of reasons. First of all, just the imagination that's involved in all the different versions of this page that people have created. This site is called CSS Zen Garden. And here's what they did. All right, Back so many years ago, People didn't use CSS to lay out pages. People used a bunch of HTML tags and a bunch of mix of HTML tags, such as the break tag and the font tag and all these tags that we really don't talk about anymore. All right? I, I've joked sometimes that I don't use the F word in this class. You know, I don't talk about the font tag in this class. All right? Because in web development, that's sort of a dirty word. Right? What's, what's bad about it? Well, it's very inflexible, and it makes things very hard to change. If you have a font tag, if, you, if you're coding things with font tags, then you're going to have a millions of font tags throughout your site, and you're going to have to change every single one of them if you want to change the way your page looks. If you put things in CSS, you can very flexibly change it. So what CSS Zen Garden was, was a site that was meant to show people what great designs you could make only by using CSS and not by using the, the tired old techniques of HTML. So for some of you that have done web development in a while, you'll notice that if you turn something in and you use something like a center tag or you use a text align attribute or you use a break tag or you use any number of these tags, I'll say that's fine but we're going to get, get, get away from using those because we're going to do everything about the appearance in CSS. And CSS is a lot more flexible and doesn't lock you down to a particular appearance. So what folks did on the CSS Zen site is they, they did essentially what you're doing for, I think it's your lab six, all right, where you take one HTML page and you put two different CSS files to it. You apply two different CSS files. So you have one piece of content that gets styled and presented two different ways. So let me bring this up. And as we're viewing this, this page only or this site only consists of this one page, more or less. As we go around and view it, every version of this page that we're going to view has the same content in it. It's just displayed differently. And how do we know that? Let's, let's 
pick out a few things and remember them. Here's a paragraph that says, a demonstration of what can be accomplished visually through CSS-based design. Zen Garden, the road to enlightenment. Download the sample HTML and CSS file. The beauty of CSS design, and, there, and there's a list over here of all these different designs. Okay, so let's go and let's, let's view these. So, here's a different design. That is the same HTML with just a different CSS file applied. A demonstration of what can be accomplished, download the sample, the road to enlightenment, select the design. Now, obviously, the people that did this are like the best web designers in the world, right? So, uh, you know, I, I don't hold anyone, including myself, up to these standards, all right? But what's the important thing for us to remember? The important thing for us to remember is that, first of all, all this goodness starts by having the HTML and CSS separate. That's like the starting point to be able to do this, to achieve its potential. So, anything that you put in the HTML that, con that, that, that contributes to the appearance of the page, like a font tag, a break tag, a horizontal rule tag, and so on, is going to make it more difficult to style things differently. All right? Now, why do we want to style things differently? Well, we've just given a couple of really good reasons, especially these days. Having a print version of your page, that's in many cases very important. Having a mobile version of your page, wow, that's very important and it's becoming more and increasingly important every day. All right? Uh, you know, you hear all sorts of numbers uh, about this. I mean, it's worse than the presidential polls, right? But um, so, so re reportedly for many websites, 10% of their traffic comes from mobile devices now. And, that, and you know that's only going to increase, all right? You know that people are moving towards, you know, more of a mobile experience than a desktop experience. Still a place for it, but again, the transition is occurring. So you can do these things if you start out and having a very good separation and don't use any of these bad old practices that people have done with web development, all right? I haven't brought any of them up in class, right, other than to just mention them very quickly. So if you've never done any HTML before, don't worry about it, all right? Just do the stuff that we've talked about in class. If you have done some HTML before, again, start getting out of the habit of doing these things, and I'll point these things out when I notice them uh, in, in your code. So that's the first lesson, that this starts, these great things start with having a clean separation between your HTML and CSS code. The second thing to learn from this just is how much power there is with CSS, all right? All the things that you can do to change, not just superficial things like the color of the font, all right, or the size of the font or the style of the font. You can change that, and that's most of the examples we've been doing in class have, have done that because, again, that's a good starting point, right? But things like changing the background images, showing how, uh, changing how these things are arranged. Notice that, you know, whoa, select the designs on this side, on this page, on this page, it's on that side. All right? That would be impossible to do if you're using old practices of web development where you put things in tables and that sort of thing. And then again, just look at, at the power uh, of this. The nice thing is, again, is you can go and you can view, actually, the CSS for this to see just exactly how they did this.
here's all the CSS. Now, if you notice, that's a lot, but it's not a crazy amount, all right? It's not like, you know, thousands of lines of code. Let's see how many lines of code there are. Oh, we can't view it here. Let's... View it on the desktop. Less than 200 lines of code. That's fairly economical <laughs> to, to change that page from looking the one way to looking the other way. All right. So uh, again, you know, take a look at this, view it, and and be inspired by it. What we will talk about. Let me just glance at my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything, because sort of the next topic. Starts on page 213, chapter 9, defining selectors. This is a real important topic. All right. So far, we've talked about selectors in HTML. Oh, I'm sorry, in CSS. And we looked and we said that this is a selector. This is a selector. This is a selector. In a nutshell, the selectors are the things that select what on the page gets that particular style rule. All right? It selects it. Now, we've gone over the HTML tag selector a lot of times. We, you know, we've done this a lot, saying h1, h2, h3. We've also briefly introduced the ID and the class. Well, we're going to define a few more selectors still. This allows you to, to point very specifically to one thing on the page that you want to maybe look different than the rest of the stuff. All right. So this gives you a lot of control about not just being able to apply styles based on the HTML tag, but being able to apply styles based on any number of different criteria. So you really have a fine degree of control and you can point to just about anything on the page and give it a certain style rule. So that's what we will pick up on Wednesday. All right, we'll see you up in lab.